Hey guys, Jeremiah here from the Tugboats. Denver's here too. I'm, I'm at his home studio right now, and we, uh, if you don't know, here on the channel, we record, um, track, mix, and master our own bluegrass music, and we upload it. Um, some of the stuff we write, some of the times it's covers. Recently we've been doing a lot of cover stuff, but we realized that there is not a lot of tutorials online for home studios, and moving into, you know, 2019, 2020, into the future, home studios are going to be the thing of the future. Um, so we want to get ahead, get you guys a head start on your own home studio if you'd like to record with us because we uh, record together most of the time but we also get guests to come in and record stuff with us. Uh, they can record the tracks in their homes, send it to us, we mix and master here. So if that's something that you're interested in then you're in the right place. This video is going to be broken down into four parts. The first part is going to be all about gear. Uh, and, and we realized that gear and equipment is a huge part of it because of budgeting and cost, but we're going to uh, give you some alternatives as well as some of the higher end stuff, and we're going to show it off. And remember, just do your research when you're buying gear. Uh, look up tutorials online or listen, like, listen alongs to different uh, recordings for different mics and find something that suits the sound that you want. The second part is going to go over mic placement, the third part is going to go over tracking and recording order, and the fourth part is going to be a song from start to finish so that you can see an example uh, of everything talked about in the first three parts put into practice. Uh, if you like this video and it's helpful, please leave a thumbs up, we would really appreciate it, and subscribe here on the channel for bluegrass content from the Tugboats. Um, so thank you guys uh, for watching the video, that's enough of the intro, time cards will be in the description below, so if you want to see a certain part, you just click it there. And let's get started with some of the gear that you're going to need to record. Okay, so this first part is going to be over the gear that you need. Now the first thing we recommend, of course, is a computer. Because you have to have a computer and you have to have software to record. Uh, I remember when I started getting into music, they had special devices just for recording, but that's a thing of the past. Now you need a computer to mix, to send, uh, you need probably internet access to get a lot of this stuff, but yeah, a good computer is a good start. Uh, tell me about the computer you have here. What is this? This is a Dell XPS. Yeah, Dell XPS. You bought it on Amazon? I got it from Best Buy. Best Buy. How much was it, roughly? It was about $1,200. Okay, about $1,200. So, there are cheaper alternatives, but here's here's the rundown of what you need. I'll put some uh, suggestions in the description and on the screen right now, but uh, Amazon will have some laptop and some desktops for you. You want an i7 processor. The i5s are slow, the AMDs are fine, make sure you get an AMD equivalent of an i7 processor. Quad core is, is the perfect thing, it'll run super fast, dual core will get the job done. Uh, you want 8 gigs of RAM, that RAM is going to be helping you run these programs, um, so 8 gigs of RAM is, is a necessity. The rest of the things don't really matter, the graphics card doesn't really matter, um, you want probably a good monitor, you can get a good set of speakers, uh, like what do you have here, you have the, the KRKs? Rocket 5s. Yeah. yeah, the Rocket 5s, uh, which are just good overall speakers, um, great for mixing, they've got a good bass, good high end. Good balance. Yeah. So. That's, that's what you want to take into consideration. You'll need, need a good computer, good monitor. The next thing uh, you'll need is a way to connect your mics to the computer, and, and you do that with, and we do that, honestly, with the it's an interface. Uh, the interface, yeah. right. Um, we have the PreSonus uh, AudioBox i2. Uh, I have one as well. I bought a, mine on Amazon, and it's great. It cuts latency. It's super clear. It's got two inputs and it allows you to hear yourself back through the headphones as well so it's a good way to record you get to hear yourself while you're recording and with every uh, thing that we're doing all the tracking that we're doing we're using two inputs uh, a left or a right or like a top or a bottom and that gives it that dynamic sound so the the PreSonus AudioBox i2 is perfect for that a lot of guys in bluegrass and a lot of guys and girls that record in bluegrass use it because it's good um, tell me about this thing right here that's a, that's a preamp Okay, so tell me about like what what does it do to help and what where is it plugged into the process? It's plugged into the, the two interface inputs. Okay. So yeah, the signal runs through the preamp before it hits the interface. Right. Like the interface has its own preamps, but the external preamps are more you know, thought after, you know. Yeah. Okay, so this is a one that you got from Ron Stewart, yeah. uh, and it's kind of a older preamp, right? Yeah. 
things from the 70s. Right, so um, there's a lot of different types of preamps that you can run through, but this isn't a necessity. In fact, when I record at home, uh, I don't have one. I just use the uh, interface, but there are some preamps out there that can really help enhance the sound crispness and the, the sharpness of it. Dynamics. Yeah, the dynamics of it can help it a lot. So take that into consideration. It's not a necessity, but if you really want to get sound that you hear from professional studios, that's that's what they have, that's what they use. Uh, the next thing you'll want is headphones. So um, when you're listening back to things, of course we have the Rocket 5 speakers here which are great, but headphones are great too. Um, you want to mix with both of them usually if you are doing some mixing and mastering. So for headphones, we have two actually. Uh, I use at home for everything that I do, I use these uh, Sennheisers, they're the HD 598s. I got them on sale on Amazon again, and I have loved them. I've had mine for four years. They sound so good. Um, we're not sponsored by anything here, but I'm just telling you, they, they are good headphones. Sennheiser makes great stuff. So they're really great. My only complaint is that they don't block the click track sound. They, they do let sound escape, but that's just the type of headphones that they are. They're open back. So you get a really great dynamic sound, but you're not going to block out the sound of the worlds around you, and you're not going to block out sound from inside the headphones. So they're not good to record a click track uh, with. However, we have the Sennheiser HD 202s over here that we use when we're using a click track. Um, they're closed back, so they do cancel out the sound both from outside and inside. Uh, so they're a lot better for the actual recording process, but the uh, 598s, yeah, I, I really like them. Highly recommend them for headphones. Super comfortable, too. I wear mine for up to 16 hours a day sometimes when I'm at work, and um, it doesn't feel like I have headphones on, so they're pretty nice. All right, so now to the other big dollar items are going to be the microphones. Um, the microphones are, are, are a crucial part of the recording experience. And uh, there are a lot of different types of microphones out there, but we recommend um, some condenser mics that are low in range and, and close in dynamics. Um, I use the Audio Technica Pro 37. I is one of my favorite mics. I take it to all of my shows I play, and it gets a great sound. And it's actually really similar in, in tone and dynamics to the mic that we have here. They're a cheap alternative to what we have here. Um, that's probably my would be my go-to suggestion. Remember, when you're buying a mic for an instrument, we have two tracks. We need two of them, so you would need two uh, Audio Technica Pro 37s or whatever you want to record with. In this case, like I said, look around, listen around, find something that has the sound you want. What do you uh, What are you using here? These are KM 184s. Yeah, Newman KM 184s. Um, he got them also from Ron Stewart. A lot of guys use them, like all the box cards recordings are done on them. They're excellent mic. They run 850 bucks. I just saw it. A piece. Yeah, a piece. So, you know, it's a pretty penny, but these are the like top of the line mics really. There's only one or two above it for what they are for that condenser. Yeah, for that type of mic. Um, the next thing you'll need is stands. Doesn't really matter. Boom stands are good. You want something with accurate positioning that can hold it. And then you want some cords. Don't buy bad cords, buy nice cords that aren't going to have shorts um, because the, the cords, if you have a really nice mic and a cheap cord, you're just limiting yourself. So go ahead and buy a nice quality, it doesn't have to be a super long cord, but you know, a nice quality cord. Um, and then if you're doing a vocal, we recommend a, a surround sound, a surround, I'm sorry, surround large mic, diaphragm. yeah, large diaphragm uh, mic. Uh, Samsung makes a few good ones. Audio Technica, of course, makes a few good ones. New one makes some high high end ones. Uh, we actually use uh, what is that? An ML MG M MXL MXL, yeah. uh, which is a, a good. Um, it's pretty cheap, but it does the job. Yeah, it's like what fifty dollars probably. I think it's seventy. Yeah, that's seventy. The Samsung yeah. I use for all my vocals is like seventy as well. Yeah. So uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of a mic to get that done. Um, especially because you're going to be recording it, it's basically going to be mono anyway, so yeah, it works pretty well. So that is the basic gear you need. You need the cords, of course you might need something like a um, headphone cord or like an eighth inch to eighth inch or a quarter inch to quarter inch uh, to actually plug your computer up to the input, USB. Um, a lot of the stuff is going to come with the correct cords, but just keep in mind that you might get it all set up and be like, I'm a cord short. I'm an eighth inch to eighth inch short. So just be aware of that. Run to your local Best Buy, Amazon it, two days shipping, you got it. Uh, so that is it for the gear. We're now going to talk about mic placement 
and uh, Mike's set up, and we'll begin to talk about some of the tracking steps. Alrighty, so it is time to show you a little bit about mic placement. Um, Denver and I were talking in between these parts and we were talking about how important it is to have good mic placement. Uh, you can have $20,000 equipment and completely ruin it in execution. So the execution of this part is really important. We're going to talk about mic placement for each instrument. We're going to start with the mandolin, even though this is in the order you usually are going to record, but yeah, we're going to start with the mandolin. Um, so tell me about how you're going to set up the mandolin here. Usually uh, put both, t take two mics and put one under and above the right hand. About probably like a foot or more. You yeah. want to keep distance though. So this one is going to point right above, about right here, right? Well, more like the top of the hand. Okay, top of the hand. Yeah. It's like a foot. Yeah. And then the bottom one is bottom of the hand. Yeah. And a foot, roughly. Yeah. yeah. So be different for everybody, though. Right. Different and, tones and stuff. yeah, it depends on the tone of the player and the tone of the mics. Um, I when I usually set up mine, I try to do the same thing, but I get closer with the the Pro Thirty Seven. I usually do like eight inches, but it's going to be different every time you set it up and every time that you play. But for one more time, yeah, for the mandolin, we're going to be pointing this one, pretend there's a line drawn here at the top of the hand, and this one to the bottom of the hand, and about a foot away for each one. Alright, let's go ahead and go to the next instrument. Okay, next up is the guitar. Uh, the guitar is a little bit different, but you'll notice a pattern here. This, this mic right here, whether this is your uh, one or two for us, it's going to be our right because it's going to be uh, his right is going to be a foot away yet again, and it's going to be pointing at the hand uh, where the hand is going to be playing the guitar, so roughly this, the back part of the strings here. And then this mic is going to be uh, parallel to the fourth, to, to where the uh, body meets the neck here, um, and then it's going to be pointing to right here, correct? At the edge, yeah. At the edge of the sound hole there. So yet again, parallel to where the neck meets the body, and then at an angle to uh, the sound hole. Alright, so that is how you set up the guitar. Alright, so the banjo is really similar to the mandolin. Unlike the guitar, you'll see here that we're going to be pointing the mics instead of being flat, they're going to be pointed down, and this one is going to be pointing up, and yet again, it's going to be a foot away from the top of the hand and a foot away from the bottom of the hand, and they're basically uh, stacked on top of each other just like that. That way they capture all the sound that the banjo is going to be making. Okay, so on to the upright bass. Okay, we're just finishing adjusting the bass mics now. We sometimes take uh, 5 to 10 minutes to really adjust the sound mics, the mics for the sound, rather. Uh, we'll listen and say, like, this is muddy, this isn't crisp enough, this is too close, this is too loud, you got to get the gains right. Uh, but let's see exactly what we're doing here. Uh, for the bass, we're pointing uh, this top mic into where the hand is going to go, yeah. usually, onto... Uh, a foot or more away. Right, a, foot or, a little bit more sometimes, because it is boomier and it's kind of louder. And then this bottom mic is going to be pointing basically directly at the bridge. Uh, about eight inches. About eight actually. inches, yeah. So you're going to get a little bit closer for, for that one. Yeah. And, yeah, that's it. Let's take a step back so you can get an idea of what it looks like. Okay, so we don't have a fiddle set up because neither of us usually play fiddle. Uh, but for a fiddle set up, you're going to be basically pointing... Let's pretend this is the fiddle for a moment. Uh, it is a bass fiddle, I suppose. But these mics are going to be really close to the bridge and then usually over top pointing directly into the bridge, correct? About, yeah, about a foot away. Yeah. yeah. About a foot away pointing maybe one uh, here going into the bridge here and then, and then another one here going into the bridge. Oh, yeah. So that's kind of what you would do for a fiddle. Okay guys, we're here at the computer and we're going to talk a little bit now about the process. You've got your mic set up and you're ready to start recording. The first thing we record is the guitar track, but before we record a guitar track, we get a click track going. So can you go ahead and play an example of a click track real quick? So for in, in the software that we're using here, we're using uh, Cubase Elements. 
Um, it's what Denver likes to use. I like to use um, Adobe Auditions just because I have it, basically. Uh, but a lot of people use Pro Tools, but Denver likes Cubase because he feels like it's a little bit more um, intuitive, a little bit more user-friendly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, really, it just comes down to whatever you want to use. And as you see here, we've already got the um, some of the tracks already recorded, and this is a song that's going to be out uh, kind of soon on our next volume. But the metronome track down there in the, in this case, in the bottom right, is called a, or a click track, is what we use to keep our timing. Um, so what you want to do is find the speed of the song. In this case, what was it? It was... 266. It was 266. It was, so it was 133. Yeah. 133 beats per minute, which is kind of fast. It's kind of fast song. Uh, and then we multiply it by 2, or we put it over 2. Um, we do this so that we get a up beat, uh, a in between, a down, and in between, and up and in between. That way, it helps the bass and the mandolin uh, have something that they can keep their time to. Both the chop and the bass note will have a uh, something they can keep timing to. So let's go ahead and just listen to uh, the metronome for a second. So the bass is going to be boom, 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 boom. So every other one, or boom, 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 boom. So the ups and the downs, and then the mandolin's going to be in between those. Boom, ch boom, ch boom, ch boom. So yeah, so that's how you would play around that timing like that. So you'd find the speed of your song, multiply by two. That would be your metronome speed or your click track speed in this case. Uh, the first thing we're going to record once you got your software open, you create a new project, uh, you got your click track set is the guitar. So let's go ahead and see. Uh, go ahead and see play a little bit of the guitar track. Uh, that we did here. So this is with the click track. Okay, you can go ahead and stop it there. So what we did was we set up the mics. We've got a left and a right channel, or the left mic and the right mic. Uh, as you can see here, we've got the uh, the guitar one and guitar two. The guitar one is, in this case, the left one, right? Yep. And then the guitar two is the right one. And so over here in the input, we changed it to right stereo in and left stereo in. And, and then uh, it's got just a standard stereo out. And so that way we get that dynamic sound. So go ahead and start from the very beginning, from zero to zero. And you'll hear what we do to get everything timed together. So go ahead and start it there. So it won't be anything for the first little bit. And in, in this case, what we usually do is we do a countdown. So we'll do one, one, two, and one, two. So we'll do a countdown. It starts on that downbeat there. Now, this requires you to be able to understand what the song is going to sound like in your head. You have to be able to say, okay, it's going to have this intro. You have to know the arrangement of the song. Everybody that plays needs to know the arrangement of the song. But by having that... Uh, countdown, it kind of helps everybody fall into place. And you've got to pretend like everybody's playing along, you have to play dynamically, but that's just part of the process. So we do the guitar track, after we've got a guitar track, we'd go ahead and once we got the mic set up, we do the guitar break. So go ahead and slide down there and, and do the guitar uh, rhythm and the break at the same time. You can see it there, yep, go ahead. <laughs> So, as you'll notice here, we don't have the levels adjusted yet, but this should give you an idea of uh, what it's going to look like. So next we do bass, so we do like the chord progression, and then we're going to do our timing chord next, which is going to be bass and mandolin. So we do bass next, go ahead and play all of them with the bass there. Okay, so yet again here, we got left stereo in, uh, right stereo in uh, for the bass, we have that left and right. And then we do the mandolin, so go ahead and do the mandolin. We do the chop first, usually, as a track, and then we do the, the break as a separate track. So go ahead and play that, and then go down here to the break in a second as well. Got some fill there in the back, and let's go ahead and go to the break real quick. Do the mandolin break. Thank you. 
Okay. And then the last thing we're going to do is the banjo. Now, we don't have the banjo actually done yet because Denver likes to take his time doing it. So, um, this is just me coming over here and doing this in a day. And we do a group of songs in a day. Uh, and so what he's going to do is in the same process do that uh, left, left stereo in, right stereo in, just like we showed, and do the banjo. And then we start adjusting levels. And then we can basically master it, which is adjusting the overall volumes and overall EQs, and then we release the music. Uh, for vocals, we would usually just do a mono or, or a mono in, right? Yep. So just one track, uh, and then we would use uh, that uh, dynamics round mic uh, for that. And so it would just be instead of having, um, you know, here we can see two for each one. It would just be one. It would be one vocal. And then if it was a harmony, the harmony would be the same way. It would just be one mono vocal track uh, as well. So let's go ahead and open up one that we've done here on the channel so we can take a look at what it looks like when it's all done. Some of the effects, we can talk about some of the effects and some of the mixing in it. Okay, to walk you through this process one more time, we're going to show uh, an example of a song we released a little bit ago, which is Birmingham Turning Ar Turn Around, uh, Keith Whitley tune. So you open up a new project. Um, you're going to select the record button on, it helps if you know the software, but you're going to select the record for the two tracks and you're going to re record them at the same time. Uh, you can see here we've got a, ma a mandolin, a mandolin right, a mandolin left, guitar right, guitar left, and these I actually recorded at my house and sent to Denver. When you record or when you send something like this uh, to someone else, like let's say you're sending the guitar to us, what you're going to do is send a mp3 of the guitar left so everything is muted except for the guitar left, and then you're going to mute everything and send the guitar right. And so that way we can import both of them and edit them both, both of them separately. And so when I send stuff to Denver, I do that for every instrument, for every track, for every vocal part. Um, so let's go ahead and play a little bit of this, and we'll talk about some of the mixing stuff that we do here. So you can see here, uh, Denver put in his, his banjo track, is the one that has a higher gain on it. Uh, his mics are way more sensitive than mine, way more dynamic, so the gains are very different. So he's got to adjust the volumes on mine a little bit differently than he adjusts the volumes on his. And you can see here is the, uh, the vocal track uh, that you can see that it's got the harmony part coming in here. So the rest of it, I just leave blank, ex uh, and I'll even mute the rest of it just for that part when you come in with the harmony. So that's basically what a break track would be, is that before and after it would be blank or mute, and then you would actually just play the break. That way you don't muddy up the sound any, anything like that. You crop it at the front and the back, you mix the volumes, get it the way you like it, and yeah, you're good to go. Um, when you export something, if you know how to use the software, you just usually go to File, Export, and then save it as an MP3, uh, or audio mix down is what most of the so softwares call their mp3 exporting. Alright, so for the fourth part we're going to talk a little bit about our process. We picked the song, we said we want to do Leaving, it's a James King song, we heard it on YouTube, um, and we wanted to do it in this very similar arrangement minus a fiddle break. So I decided we're going to do it in the same arrangement, three verses, three choruses, three breaks. It's going to be guitar, mandolin, uh, banjo kick, guitar, mandolin, banjo. Um, then turn around at the end where it will go to a five. So I figured out the arrangement I wanted, then I did a scratch guitar track to just get an idea of what it's going to sound like all together. One, two, and one. I did the actual guitar track, I did the actual bass track, I did the mandolin track, and then I would usually go ahead and just do the vocal track. Uh, what I'm going to do is go home and do the vocal and send it to Denver and he'll import that later. He's going to go ahead and do the banjo track, and then he's going to mix it, add every all the effects he needs, he's going to EQ it, which is going to... Uh, take out some of the notes that are off too often in the air, uh, too often being played or uh, too loud and the sound is mudding up the sound. And then we're going to add uh, reverb and other effects like that. Uh, and we'll talk about that stuff maybe in a future video a little bit more about that. But that's a really lengthy process and it usually takes a long time to mix and master. And then we would, um, once we got everything mixed and mastered, we would export it. I slap it on a video and we put it on YouTube. <laughs>
that is how we release our music. I uh, hope this helps you guys in some ways and gives you an idea of how to set up a home studio for bluegrass music and how we get our sound. If you want to record with us, let us know in the comments below. Obviously, we're not going to be able to record with everybody, but um, we do plan to record with some friends in the near future, and we may even be able to record with you. Um, so, from, for Denver Smith and myself, thank you guys so much for watching. Catch the tugboats on the show near you soon. Make sure you hit that subscribe button if you have enjoyed. Until next time, guys, keep picking.